All right, cool. All right, hi, my name's Jay, Jay Zbarth. I'm also known as Zbarth in the free gaming world. I primarily make uh, point-and-click adventure games, and I've made 15 games, 14 of them are free, and then this new one is the first one I've charged for. So, let's start. I started in 2007 uh, using the sponsorship model. All my games are sponsored by Newgrounds. Um, the first game I made was called The Visitor. It's about a little alien slug that comes down, and uh, it was really gory and campy. There's a part where it crawls into a cat's butt, and the cat explodes. As a result, it went viral. <laughs> and uh, I started getting calls from like Comedy Central and stuff like that, asked me to make adventure games for them. So I said, okay, let's, let's keep going with this. My most popular series is called The Several Journeys of Remus. It's these two guys right here. It's a medieval exterminator and his uh, sidekick, Liam the Purple Bear. I've made five chapters. Each one was played millions of times. It was really uh, well received. Every chapter was nominated for some kind of award. I did one once a year, basically. Um, Jay's games nominated best best game of the year and best art and stuff like that. So, and it earned top spots on both Congregate and Newgrounds. Had a really long run on the front page of both those sites. It was getting an uh, average of four to five stars. Was doing really well. But the situation was. Story-based games, there's just a real lack of replayability, so the sponsorship money was kind of limited. Uh, just, you're not going to get the $30,000 chunks when you only can play it once. You know, some of the game you're going to fire up a million times over lunch. So as you can see, it was starting to drop. I got $7,500, but by June I was at $3,000. And the time I was putting into it just was not worth it. And I had a partner, too, who was doing the programming. We were splitting everything 50-50, so $1,500 for... <laughs> two or three months work is just not cutting it. So we have all these fans I said, let's just try to direct, sell direct to them and see what happens. The challenge was I wanted to be like Wajidai, just crank a game out a year and uh, build your fan base and be able to just do nothing but adventure games for a living. But could I convert the free fans to paid? And would they be mad? I've given them lots of 14 free games. Are they going to be annoyed that I'm charging them now? So the decision was let's take the several journeys of Remus. It's the most popular, it has the most content and try and make a paid version of it. To avoid the backlash, we said, oh, let's make two games. Let's take the free game series, do one more in that series to like, kind of make them feel like they got something, and then try to charge them for the longer one, and that way they won't be mad at me. That was my plan. The smaller game was self-sponsored. We just put ads for uh, the paid one. So our, our, our goal was to get that one out there and just funnel people back to our site and sell, sell them on it. And as soon as we launched it, we started accepting pre-orders like the first day, and uh, yeah, it went well. So it took two years. We started, we actually were really optimistic at first. We were like, summer 2010, and yeah, January 2012, it actually came out. Um, and it launched with the companion, The Several Dreams of Remus Chapter 4, which is free to play, and went on all the uh, free portal sites. And there was no backlash among the fans. They were just really happy. They were, they were, uh, it's exactly what we would had hoped for. They were satisfied. They had the free game, the next chapter, and there was a whole other game to play, and they wanted to play more. So well, right, we actually finished it, which is always, I didn't think it was going to happen <laughs> after two years. My wife was uh, very doubtful. She'd never see the end of this. And we made $5,000 in pre-orders, which was cool. Uh, we weren't really offering anything special for a pre-order, and it was a two-year process. Uh, but the, it helped pay for the voice acting and the music. And I created a series of video diaries, which were really low budget and cheap, and just me talking to the camera held out. But it really it created a real sense of community. And when people watched it, they felt really connected personally to the project. And it really it created hardcore, lifelong fans. Like, it's, anything I do, these guys are typing and tweeting about it. And it was pretty cool. And the Civil Journeys Chapter 4, the free one, was the best in the series. It was the best reviewed. It was the perfect length. And everyone really seemed to like it. It converted one in 300, which was exactly what we were hoping for. It funneled everyone right to the, the game. And the first week it had 3 million plays. It's currently at 2.6 million. And we got some feedback early about it, the game feeling a little, I don't know, a little short. So uh, we were able to kind of jump on that before we launched it and add in like some, some free mini games here and there, put some secret quests in, a uh, little hidden object game where you're squishing bugs on every screen. And it really, it wasn't much, but it really added, made the game feel a little bit more robust, and people, people responded to it. And the voice acting and writing was universally praised as high quality, which usually for adventure games and indie in general, people, the voice acting is usually terrible. But uh, yeah, we did a good job on that one. And so I know I won the indie prize for best storytelling. 
we sold uh, over, ended up selling over 3,000, probably higher than that now, 3,000 copies. We still sell one every day, one to four. Sometimes we have a mysterious weekend where we sell like 10. And uh, Blackberry Playbook, which I wasn't sure about, it was an easy port, so we did it, and it ended up selling 770 copies, which is probably even more now. And so we made, in 18 months, we made $30,000 and uh, has every indication of, of having a long sales tail. It's still coming in pretty steady. So what went wrong? Well, no budget. It was just a stress city. Like some months, like nothing was happening. A lot of gray hairs. And the disappearing deadlines. So we wanted to do it by the summer of 2010, but you know, with no money, we had to keep switching. So we did jump on a little client project. We ended up doing three client games in that time frame, and it really... It screws with your focus and momentum when you like stop and you come back to it and you're like, okay, what was that puzzle supposed to be? And it really makes it kind of a chunky production. And I, I, I changed the name. So the Several Dreams Remus was supposed to be the free one and the Ballads Remus would be paid and it would really help differentiate between them. But people just mangled the title. It was like the Several Ballads of Remus and Google searches, it's all weird. I was like, I don't know if that really did anything positive. <laughs> And the long production schedule, so two years, we can create lots and lots of hype for it, but when it comes out and it's not a 10-hour game, people are like, well, what, what were you doing all that time? Why did it take so long? And not realizing that we were stopping and working on other projects. So some were kind of disappointed. Um, I did write a bigger game, but at the two-year mark, I'm like, okay, if we continue, this is going to be a four-year project, and we can barely afford what we're doing now. So we chopped it off, and even though it's way longer than any of the free ones, it plays at about three hours. And the other ones play for 10 minutes. People still are like, oh, it feels kind of small and short for a commercial game. And the free games had a much more epic uh, storyline, more dramatic, because I could just you know do a little bit and then stop. But I was trying to create a, a self-contained story, so I made it a smaller thing. And then uh, when people played it, the hardcore fans were like, well, you know, this one's at the end of the world, and this is about a new bed. I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. And Flash, this the technical side, it just, once it gets to like 200 meg, it just starts to like, like just chug and didn't compile very good and just, it was, it was a stressful time. And uh, a lot of the vectors and alphas I used in Flash, it just, some of the scenes, just the performance is not the best. And it also lacked a bunch of commercial design features because I just, I was a little ignorant and green about the commercial market. I was so used to the free stuff and it was working there, I just said, let's just do the same thing. But I didn't have a standard installer, I didn't have like a hint system in place, and it just kind of ruined chances with publishing. It didn't feel professional enough. And the flash, the flash look, the vector look, you know, the, you kind of get that stigma of the, oh, well, it's a, just a flash game, it gets kind of fluffed off. And, you know, you get reviews and you read the comments section, especially on like Steam Greenlight and stuff like that. They see a Flash game and they're just, no! So, kind of a bit of the hurdle to get over. And we use Flash, so it really limited the, the chances to put it on uh, iOS and stuff. So, which sucks because it's a perfect game for mobile. And here's just a breakdown 69% of all our sales came from our website, from the free game just coming over. Playbook was the other 24. And then there's a a million of these little sites to come say, hey, sell it on my portal. But they really didn't amount to anything. Like, like over a year or 18 months, like maybe one sale would come in. And it's a little sketchy sometimes. Some of them don't, you're not quite sure if they're telling the truth. Um, so the conclusion was I was able to successfully convert the free fans to paying customers with no backlash at all. In fact, they became harder core fans as a result of it. Um, the, the chapter four worked out exactly how we wanted. It fueled all the sales. I don't, even, I don't know if, if we didn't do that, I don't know if we would have had any sales. We had no marketing budget at all. We just winged it. So it's doubtful we would have had the success we had. And with an actual budget, it wouldn't take two years. It would be six to eight months. I think we could crank another one out. So yeah, when you break it down, it was financially a lateral move at best. It was probably the same as a sponsorship. It was worse than minimum wage. You really calculate the hours we put into it compared to what we made. But I think with more marketing muscle, a tighter production schedule, I think it has way more potential than what I was doing with the sponsorship market. It just the creating a fan base when you really connect with them on a personal level. Like they're so loyal and hardcore. It's with the sponsorship you could you make a game and you just hope for the best. It's just a roll of the dice. And if it doesn't connect with them, they don't want anything to do with it or you get a lower rate. But these fans. I literally could do any game and they would buy it at this point. They're just that hardcore about it. 
and adventure games and fans in general are already hardcore, so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. So I'm going to make another one and take everything I learned and just do another one and just build, the, build, build on it. And hopefully I can get to the point where I just never have to take another client job and I just make adventure games for a living. And that's me. Thanks for that, Jay. Uh, so, questions. Who's got a question? Can we get you on the microphone? So then it's recorded. How much did you sell the game for? Ten dollars. But I think the next one I will go to fifteen. I've heard from fans that that fifteen is the price point they kind of expect and are willing to pay. And so I can make it maybe a beefier game. I think I could fifteen is where I'd go. Were you expecting the playbook to make up um, almost a quarter of your sales? Absolutely not. I really underestimated the playbook. I kind of wrote it off. We were like, oh, it could go to playbook. And I was like, yeah. But then we got a free device from them, and uh, we were really early adopters of it because a Flash game license actually hooked me up with that. And then uh, so we're like, oh, I'll just put it over and see what happens. We charged, I believe, four ninety nine, and yeah, almost eight hundred sales. It was definitely cool. Uh, just interesting. Though. Do you think that was because it was uh, one of the rare games of the time on that particular market? I think so. We were really early in the state, and I put we put all the free ones that I had done there, and they were all really high in the charts. So it basically worked the same way as it did. Like we got a bunch of people playing the free ones, and then so when I came out with the one that was paid, they're like, "Oh well, I like those ones." And yeah, it was there wasn't that much competition on it then. Would you ever go free to play? As in uh, in-game act. Because one of the, it's actually a debate that I've had quite a lot. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a colleague of mine in the UK called Nicholas Lovell and I, and a, another friend of ours, and we do this uh, regular uh, panel where we take three games in an hour and try and turn them three to play. And every single session, Monkey Island comes up as an example. Seriously, it's every time. And we we come up with a few ideas of how you might make it a better game by making it something that has in-app purchase. But generally, what you have to do is break away from the handcrafted puzzles in, not in every case, but in a lot of cases, and chuck in things where adding an item might make it more interesting or add strategy options. Is that anything, something you'd ever think of or is it just you want to make this kind of game and therefore it has I, to be paid? I, I would be open to it, yeah. I just never thought of anything like that, like charging for items and things. I just, I, did, I was like, it's a story game. It's kind of like, here it is. I don't know what I would monetize. I never really... No, it's, it's really tricky, and yeah. actually the best one not, didn't come from us, it came from an audience member. Uh, you know this sort of idea of a particularly the hidden object game type mm -hmm. puzzle, where um, you had an object and you've got to place it in the right place on the screen, and someone said, well, why don't you make it so you have a certain number of uses of that item? And, and that sounds on the surface, it's like an energy mechanic, but actually what it is, it's saying, don't just keep pressing the bloody screen, which actually mm -hmm. makes the game potentially better, in theory. Now, we've never tried it, so we don't know it's real, but it's that kind of stuff yeah. that I think is worth experimenting with. Maybe not your game, but I think somebody will experiment with that kind of stuff, and maybe we'll see different, different experiments happening. Enough of me talking. Any more questions? So I'm uh, curious. <coughs> you say that cultivating a fan base uh, creates a you know, stable market for you, which makes sense. What uh, what do you recommend in terms of actually doing to generate a fan base in that manner, um, other than spending like four years creating free to play yeah. games first? I think the video diaries is the cheapest and easiest way to disconnect. They see your face, they feel like you're talking to them. The ones I've done were always super. They're they're not good. They're just me talking and it's shaky and it's not. I don't even put it on a tripod and people ah oh, you gotta do more of those. Like they just it really made them feel like they knew me. And they, at the end of when I finished the game after two years, they're like, "Oh, we really felt like we're releasing a game too with you." Like they really got connected to the project hardcore. So it sounds like you almost like ran a Kickstarter pre-Kickstarter, right? And so would you do a Kickstarter to do the second game? Or I'm going to do a Kickstarter. I actually for the second one, I, I went with the indie movie kind of model where I just took my budget and I broke it into points. And I just got some investors on board. So at least I have some money to work with and not just starving the whole time. And then definitely Kickstarters. When it comes to Canada, I'll be able to do it. It's interesting because the previous speaker we had in the room, uh, Joe, was talking about how important the long tail was, how, how important 
having multiple games in the same kind of vein mm -hmm. allowed him to build a bigger pipe so that when he launched the second version of his Clutter game, that had a direct impact on additional sales, quite a lot of additional sales mm -hmm. of his first game. Uh, I mean, it sounds like you're a bit too early for that, but I mean, is that sort of forming part of your strategy? Yeah, absolutely. I like watch it. I with the Blackwell series of adventure games, and uh, I talked to him, and he said, "Yeah, like you release this one, the first one sells. The third one, the first two sell. So it's like that's definitely my strategy." Yeah, I, I suspect it's, it takes a lot of investment and effort, but it's this idea of moving to a fan base is, is I think, really important. Yeah. And actually, I think that bigger studios neglect that attitude sometimes. Uh, and the more we see of that, you know, really engaging with an audience. And actually, I think the, the transition has been really important for me, is watching studios going from making products to making services, where actually caring about who the audience is matters even more, and how you manage their life cycle as well. Any more questions? Yeah, when, when you reach your audience, do you do that through email? Do you, like, how do you let them know that, hey, there's a new video up, uh, or Facebook, or something like that? Um, the website, I post a blog, I have a, like a, a blog I do. We have a mailing list, and people subscribe to, to the YouTube videos, so it, I, it tells them, I believe. But the people watching them are like coming, usually coming to the site every day looking for updates too. They're, they're, the fans I tend to get are like really passionate. I think that's, isn't, that's true, isn't it? I think the, uh, you can never update enough. You can never yeah, absolutely. communicate enough. And the things you think that are just useless, mm. they love. Like, yes. here's a picture of me drawing, uh, you know, they, they want to know everything. It's like, why? All right. Well, it's because they want to be, I, yeah. I mean, I think it's because they want to feel part of it. I mean, yeah. uh, back in like 98, 99, I was running an online gaming service called Wireplay for British Telecom. And uh, what we found is that we put uh, volunteers to become the sort of club captains. Now, this isn't scalable in today's tech. But the reality was that that's what made the service work, was that we let the players take ownership of that whole mm -hmm. experience. But it didn't stop us having to you know, work ourselves you know, ragged by making sure we were there to talk, to respond constantly, constantly. It takes a lot of effort. And I also like, I do listen to them if they're saying, oh, this, we like this, I'll do more of it. And then they feel, oh, well, I had a direct hand in that. And Is there a line though? I mean, that's, that's I suspect that a lot of us have, uh, want to listen to our audience, and actually, a lot of the time, I'm trying to push developers to make sure they spend more time thinking of the audience. But do you think there's a point where that has to stop and you have to take? For me, it's like if I hear the same complaint maybe five times, then I'm like, okay, that's something. Like, well, I used to do uh, timed puzzles and just like hatred <laughs> so across the board. I was like, okay, next one, I'm not doing that anymore. And then, it, I don't know, just the reviews went up, so sometimes it Note works. Yourself, no time puzzles. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Are you sure? Last chance. So at that point, I'm going to thank Joe very much for his time. It's been great. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, everyone. I will check the game out. And